Hi traders, in this video I'm going to show you how to create an EMA confluence filter for your scripts. So basically what that means is here I have two EMAs plotting onto my chart. We have a 50 EMA here and a 100 EMA below it. And for this particular script, it doesn't matter what entry reasons you detect in your script. You can be detecting any candlestick pattern that you like. But for today's example, I'm keeping it very simple. And the entry reason we're detecting is just simple engulfing candles. They don't have to be swing lows. They just need to engulf the previous candle. And what this script is doing is, first of all, price must be above this 50 EMA before a valid signal will be detected. But the... 50 EMA must also be above the 100 EMA before a valid signal is detected. And so in today's video, I'm going to show you how I created this script. So first of all, let's remove the script, reset the chart and create a new blank script. So here I am with a blank script. Let's get started. First thing I'm going to do as always is get user input. And for today's video, we're just going to get two uh, inputs, two EMA length inputs. So here we have two inputs, EMA length one, EMA length two of type integer. And we're just going to set it to 50 and 100 by default. And the next thing we're going to do is get the actual EMAs. So we need EMA1 is set to EMA close with a length of EMA length 1, this input here. And then we'll just copy this, paste it down here, and change these to 2. So there's our EMAs. Now we can draw them to make sure that they're working properly. So the first one I'm going to plot as EMA1. And I'm going to change the color based on whether price is above or below it. So we're going to say, is the close above EMA1? If so, set the color to color.green. Otherwise, set it to color.red. And we're going to give it a line width of 2. Let's thicken it up a little bit. Now, I could copy this line of code, paste it in there, change this to EMA2. And we'll just get rid of this because it would be confusing to have both EMAs changing color. We'll just set this second EMA to color.blue. And we'll just thicken it up a little bit, change the line width to a three, save the script, and we shouldn't have two EMAs drawing there, perfect. And so now in order to get the filter and detect whether these EMAs are above or below each other, we need to st detect some uh, entry reasons. So here I'm gonna say detect entry reasons, and again, this could be any entry reason you want. I'm just using engulfing candles today because they're an easy example. So I'm gonna create two variables here, long entry and short entry. Long entry is going to be set to whether the uh, current candle close is greater than or equal to the previous candle's open. And did the previous candle close as a bearish candle or a doji? Was the previous candle's closing price less than or equal to the previous candle's opening price? And then it's just the opposite for a bearish engulfing candle. So there's our long entries and short entries. Now we can plot these to the chart. So create a new section of code here, call this plot entry signals, and we'll just use plot shape for this, not plot shape, plot shape, uh, long entry. Uh, I like to do it this way. If you don't do it this way, uh, I'll show you what happens in a second. But what we're doing, we're saying, if we have a long entry, then set plot shape to one, which means it will plot a shape, otherwise plot NA, and we'll give it a style of shape dot arrow up for a bullish candle and the color will be color.green and the location will be location.below bar. So just really quickly, let me save the script, make sure that's working. There we go. So now the reason why I like to do it this way, because we could just get rid of this code here and this will still compile. If I save the script, you can see it's doing exactly the same thing. The difference is up here. So when we have a signal, you can see that this plots 1.00000 or however many decimals are on your price chart. But now if I go to any candle that does not have a signal, we're also getting 0 0.00000. This is obviously a long number. And if you've got a lot of plots in your script, uh, these numbers can add up quickly. If you have six digits plotting for every single shape on your chart, whenever there's a, uh, no signal, you, you, it'll just really clutter up your chart. So I like to add this little bit of code in here. So what we're saying is we're saying, if we have a long entry detected, then set this plot shape to one, which means true. It'll just draw the shape. Otherwise, plot NA. 
So now if I save the script, you'll see that when we hover over any candle that does not have a signal, we're just plotting NA. It's much shorter than a six digit number. So that's why I do that here. Uh, let's move on, copy this line of code, paste it in here, get rid of below bar because by default, uh, this plot shape plots above the bar. And for bearish signals, uh, that's just fine. So we're gonna plot shape for every short entry and a color of color.red. Now if I save the script, we'll be getting bearish engulfing candles plotting to our chart as well. But we're not taking into account our EMA filters yet. So for that, let's add a new section up here called get filters. We're gonna have a long filter and a short filter. Now our long filter is going to be, um, there's a couple of ways we can do this. First of all, we could just check if the EMAs are in confluence. So we could just say here, is EMA one greater than EMA two? Or is EMA one less than EMA two for a short filter? Then if we add this Boolean into our um, entry reason detection down here, so short filter and long filter combined with our long entry and short entry conditions. Now, if I save the script, we'll only be getting long uh, bullish engulfing candles plotting if this 50 EMA is above the 100 EMA and vice versa for shorts. We'll only be plotting uh, bearish signals if the 100 EMA is above the 50 EMA. So that's the first part of an EMA confluence filter. And this works just pr pretty good, works pretty fine actually. Uh, but if you wanna take it one step further, you can also detect if price action is below this 50 EMA for shorts or above for longs. So if we wanted to, we could add into this long filter, is the current close greater than EMA one? And is the EMA one above our EMA two? and vice versa for short. So we could say, is the price of the current candle below EMA1 and is EMA1 below EMA2? So when I save the script here, uh, this entry pattern here is gonna go away as is this one here and this one up here. So now if I save the script, so there we have it. So now we're only plotting signals if the 50 EMA is below the 100 EMA and price action is below the 50 EMA and the opposite for long trades. So that's one way to apply an EMA filter. Uh, but before I end this lesson, I thought it might be interesting to show you guys how you can disable your EMA2 in your script in case you have a script that has this functionality in it, but you wanna allow both options for your users. So you wanna allow the user to disable EMA2 and only use the EMA1 as your filter. The easiest way to do that is to just set EMA2 to zero, EMA2 length to zero, and detect that in your script. So I'll show you what I mean right now. So down here, we can change our filter to say, is the closing price above our EMA1? And is EMA1 above EMA2? Or is EMA length two equal to zero? You can copy that down into there. And so now our filter will return true if price is above the EMA and our EMAs are in confluence or we've disabled EMA2 by setting its length to zero. Now, the problem is if I save this script, we'll get an error whenever I come up and set this to zero because you cannot have, if I click on that, it'll tell me the error. We cannot have a length of zero passed to the EMA function. It must be above zero. So what we need to do here is say, EMA uh, length two equal to zero question mark, then set it to one, otherwise set it to EMA length two. So what we're saying here is we're saying for our second EMA, if the user has set EMA length two to zero, then we just wanna get an EMA with a length of one. Otherwise we do wanna use our EMA length two parameter because it's set to something other than zero. So now if I save the script, that will work just fine. If we come up here and we set EMA length two to zero, we'll be getting any signal that closes uh, above or below this 50 EMA. But you can see we're also plotting our second EMA with a length of one. So if we come down to where we plot our EMAs and we check here if our EMA length two is set to zero, 
So EMA length two equals zero question mark. Then we want to draw NA. Otherwise, we actually do want to draw out EMA two. So now if I save the script, minimize that, come up to the settings menu and set EMA length two to zero. Our second EMA goes away and it is now no longer being considered in our filter check. Uh, if you didn't understand anything in this video, just rewatch it. It'll make sense, I'm sure. But basically what we're doing here is we now have two EMAs. If our first EMA is above our second EMA and price action is above our first EMA, then the script will be looking for long trades. Otherwise, if our first EMA is below our second EMA and price action is below the first EMA, then the script will look for short trades. And if you want to, you can come into the settings menu here, set EMA length two to zero, hit okay. And now the script is only using the uh, first EMA as the filter. Uh, this is a very simple filter, very simple method, uh, but it works very well. Uh, but finally, one last thing that I have found useful in my own scripts is to detect how many candles are above or below the EMA preceding the setup. So for example, in this case, you can see we have two candles that closed above the EMA immediately preceding our setup. What happens if you want to invalidate the setup based on this condition as well? I'll show you how to do that really quickly. So here we come up here. Uh, and above our filters, let's add in uh, EMA breach check. And what we're going to do here is we're going to create two new variables. We're going to say bars above EMA and bars below EMA. Uh, and this is going to be set to zero by default. Then we're going to use two for loops here. We're going to say for i equals zero two. And let's create a new input variable up here. Uh, we'll say EMA look back. And this is just going to be another input with a title of EMA look back, a type of integer and a default value of three. So we're going to look back three bars and count how many bars are above or below the EMA and incorporate that into our filter. So here I can change this three to EMA look back. And now we can check if the close of our current iteration, we can just put I in here, which is this guy here. So if the current iteration of our loop, our for loop looking back, if the closing price of that candle is above the EMA one, then we wanna set bars above EMA to bars above EMA plus one. And we can also check in the same for loop, we can also count how many bars close below the EMA. So he will say if the closing price of the current iteration of this loop, so, you know, we're looking back one, two, three candles. If the current candle is below the EMA or the previous candle or the one before that, then that will increment our bars below variable by one. So this is how we count candles beyond the EMA. So now if I save the script, should compile without any errors. There we go. Now all that's left to do is add these checks into our filters. So I'm going to create one more user input here. It's going to be called max bars beyond EMA. It's going to have a title of max bars beyond EMA. It's going to be of type input.integer and have a default value of one. So we're only allowed one bar to close beyond the EMA over the past three candles by default for a signal to be considered valid. So now if I come down to our long filter and short filter, we can add on the end here and bars uh, for a long trade, we're checking bars below EMA is less than or equal to max bars beyond EMA. And the opposite for short trades, we're checking and bars above EMA is less than or equal to max bars beyond EMA. So now if I save the script, we come up to the settings menu and we turn off our second EMA that will bring back this example here. And look at that. We are now invalidating this setup here because we have had more than one candle close above this 50 EMA over the past three bars. So now if I come up to the settings menu here, if we change this max bars, B 
beyond EMA variable to two, and we click OK, this setup will come back because it's now considered valid because we can have a max of two candles closing above the EMA for short trades. And obviously for long trades, it is the opposite. So back here, if I set this back to one, uh, sorry, if I set this to zero, that will invalidate this setup here because we've had one candle close below the EMA. So this is a great way uh, to avoid taking signals around the EMA when price is consolidating around it. So typically speaking, when the EMA is tested as support or resistance and price responds from it, it's often likely that we only have a maximum of one candle close below it. If we have more than one candle close below it preceding a setup, then that usually means that the EMA is being ignored. So the, I found in my personal trading that the optimal setting for this filter is one bar beyond the EMA over the past three bars preceding our setup. So if we zoom out a little bit and look for some examples. So you notice we're, we're working off closing prices here, not wicks, because any wicks testing the EMA is a good sign. That's a bullish sign that this EMA is acting as support and pushing price up. But if price hovers around the EMA for a little bit too long, such as in here, we do not want to be going short on any short signals if price is consolidating around the EMA because that means we're either entering a period of consolidation or price wants to reverse. So I hope you found this lesson interesting. I'm going to leave it there. I don't, I don't want it to get too long. We covered a lot of subjects here. We've covered how to create a single EMA filter. We've covered how to create two EMA filters in confluence with each other. We've covered how to create a filter with an EMA breach look back. So we're searching back three bars, counting how many bars close beyond the EMA. So above the EMA for short trades, below the EMA for long trades. And if we have too many bars closing beyond the EMA, uh, then we're adding that filter in our script as well. And there's just a few ideas for you to play around with in your own scripts to add some EMA filters to potentially optimize your strategy scripts or your setup detection indicators. If you have any questions, shoot them to me. Otherwise, I will see you in the next lesson. Good luck with your trading. Good luck with your coding. Speak to you soon. Have a great day. If you found this video helpful and you want to learn more about PineScript, head over to pinescriptmastery.com. I have an advanced course there with 70 plus lessons covering PineScript from the basics all the way up to more advanced topics such as strategy scripts and complex indicators. And if you don't want to pay for anything, that's fine. I've got a free course there as well that goes into great detail about the core fundamental concepts you need to know in order to use PineScript effectively. So I'd love to see you there. Go and check that out if you're interested in that. Otherwise, hang around, hit that subscribe button, and I'll be back with more free content really soon. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.